Well, hello, New Life Church. Glad to have you joining us for the message this week. I've been gone for a couple of weeks. You might be aware of that. Nancy and I um, spent uh, five days in Nebraska visiting her family and helping organize and take care of her dad's estate auction. And when that was all done and the packing up of stuff was all taken care of and all, then we hopped in the car and we drove across Nebraska and ended up in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Um, on the way, we stopped at a little town called Alliance, Nebraska. Yep, not, nope, not named after the Christian New Missionary Alliance. And we stopped at uh, the major tourist destination in Nebraska called Carhenge. Yes, back in 1987, some farmer over there took a bunch of old cars, um, tipped them on their noses or on their tail ends, uh, dug holes into the ground in the form of a circle, and there's about 20 cars that um, are supposed to be a replica of Stonehenge in Great Britain, uh, Nebraska. As their motto says, it's not for everyone, and trust me, they are not lying. Anyways, we got to the Black Hills and we stayed at this beautiful walkout uh, level of um, one of my close ministry friends. Um, and uh, we had some beautiful days in the Black Hills, just Nancy and I together. Uh, went to Mount Rushmore. The sky was just brilliant blue the day that we were there. We felt so blessed. Drove across the border into Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Again, absolutely gorgeous day for that incredible um, rock formation out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then we drove uh, around Custer State Park. Uh, what a highlight for us is there were herds of buffalo that were just walking right along our car. Um, baby buffaloes, little calves walking right with their moms. It was really, really special, and, and uh, then we did some hiking in Spearfish Canyon. We just had a wonderful time. We even got to see a mountain goat right on the side of the road, maybe about 15 feet away from our car one day. Um, the weather was great. The days were relaxing. The crowds were very light. Uh, so, so many things went right with this trip, but there were a couple of disappointments. We found out when we got there that they had free fishing day in state parks, or I think maybe throughout the whole entire state, on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of last weekend. I didn't have any fishing gear with me, so I wasn't able to take advantage of that, even though the day before that was started, I stopped and talked with a fisherman at one of the lakes in the Black Hills, and he showed me 15 beautiful rainbow trout that he had pulled in in an hour and a half. He said, this is the first time fishing this lake. I thought, well, if he could do it, then, well, I probably can't do it. Um, so that was a bit of a disappointment, and, and then we didn't get to see any elk, um, which I had really hoped that we would. In fact, I'd actually prayed for that, and God did not answer my prayer. So my faith in God has been shaken to its core. Why wouldn't God grant this simple prayer request that I could see an elk, and that my wife could see an elk? Why doesn't God meet my expectations? Why doesn't God fulfill all my very harmless wishes? This wasn't would have hurt anybody else. Uh, for me to see an elk, or for Nancy and I to see an elk, it would have been wonderful. More, perhaps relevantly, or realistically, why does disappointment surface so easily in my heart and in your heart? Why can satisfaction be so short-lived You'd think after a wonderful vacation like this, my heart would just be full and I'd be just grateful for everything that happens in my life and in what other people's lives, what happens in other people's lives. But I, I kid you not, the day after we got home, we got photos from a family member of, uh, who was visiting Yosemite National Park in California, a place I have longed to go for probably 30 years. And I was envious. Can you believe that? After the gorgeous time that we had in Black Hills, just so relaxing for Nancy and I, I still find myself in envy of somebody who's at a different national parks, park, able to see different things. We're, we're going to look today at a story from the end of the book of John. Actually, I wrote an email about this uh, in my Tuesday emails that I send out uh, about a month ago and, and, and revisited that story and had some more things that I saw in there that I, that I wanted to share. Um, expectations and lessons about expectations that I still need to learn about. So 
um, to, to fill you in, here is the setting, okay? Jesus has just spent time at the beach on the, on the Sea of Galilee reinstating Peter. He has told Peter three times, or asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And Peter has responded three times, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus has given him a command. Okay, if that's true, then take care of my sheep. If that's true, feed my lambs. If that's true, feed my sheep. All right? Essentially, Jesus was telling Peter, in spite of the fact that you denied me three times during his trial, I still have a lifelong purpose of leadership and servanthood for you in spite of your failures. And then right after that, Jesus um, indicates that Peter is going to die a very painful death, all right? And it's going to be against his wishes. And church history tells us, sure enough, that about 30 years later, Peter was indeed crucified. He was crucified upside down, um, church history tells us, at his own request because he felt he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus, his Savior, Jesus, his Master, Jesus, his Lord, all right? And then after that, this is what comes next. This is what wraps up the Gospel of John. So John chapter 20, just three short verses we're going to look at today. It says this, Peter turned then and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was, John in his Gospel um, explains, this was the one, the disciple, who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? All right, so John is clearly referring to himself here without wanting to name himself. Okay, verse 21. When Peter turned around and saw John, he asked, Lord, what about him? So Peter's just found out Jesus has insinuated, you're going to die in a way you don't, you don't like. Um, it's going to be crucifixion. And you're going to wish that that didn't happen to you and all. And Peter says, uh, what about him? Okay, and Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. That's it. Three verses. So much to consider. There's stuff I wrote about this as I was studying it, reflecting on it and all. that. I, I, there was no way I was going to be able to include everything in, in, in the message today that... Uh, that I really would love to, okay? So about 20 years ago, an Alliance pastor um, came to Africa when we were missionaries there for a spiritual retreat that our mission team was having together. And um, he shared a message that I've never forgotten the title of it. The title was simply this, Wind Your Expectations Down to Zero. I don't remember what subpoints he had. I don't remember at all what scripture he based his message on. But the title stuck with me. Wind your expectations down to zero. And it has helped like recalibrate my heart numerous times over the past 20 some years. Wind your expectations down to zero. I've shared that advice, that counsel with numerous people in numerous settings. Um, in discussions that I've had with them and all. Um, but I, I checked this last week and I was surprised that in my computer files where I've got all of my sermons, sermon notes, I've got them all listed in there, in those uh, computer files, there is not one time where I have preached a message along this theme of winding your expectations down to zero, even though it was so um, transformative for me because it's just helped put things, everything, so many things into balance, into perspective for me. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Wind your expectations down to zero. The first thing I'd like to do, I'd like to, to, to do is to make a clarification, okay? Because I don't want to be understood on this, all right? I am not advocating at all that we wind our expectations down in every area of our lives, Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, <clears throat> in, in, in talking about God and God's abilities, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, he says that our God is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask, all that our, our puny brains can imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. So, if anything, um, in response to this truth about God, this promise from Paul about God, the church, I think these days, days, needs to expect greater things from God than what we often expect. That's not easy for me. That might not be easy for some of you as well. But I am not saying at all, wind our expectations about what we want God to do for us down to zero. I'm not saying that 
at all. There's a second clarification that I want to make, and that is this. I am not advocating that we lower our standards for Christian leaders, for leaders of our faith, all right? Read sometime, 1 first, first Timothy chapter 3, read Titus chapter 2, and you will see a, a list of expectations. You'll see a list of standards, qualifications that Paul writes about for church leaders, including pastors. And he sets those standards extremely high in the areas of morality and spirituality and life, lifestyle standards. Frankly, so much of the disillusionment that people have about our Christian faith comes from highly visible leaders who have taken shortcuts, who've pursued compromises, or who have excessively excused themselves for being human. All right? Alternatively, in a backlash to widespread legalism from the church of the 60s and the 70s, the church from my childhood. Many people have allowed the pendulum to swing from widespread legalism to just blanket permissiveness. And neither one of those extremes serves us well. So I'm not advocating for saying, wind our expectations of church leaders down to zero. Not at all. You should be able to hold me to some very, very high standards of spirituality based on what Paul wrote to young pastors just starting in ministry. Um, so, so the question is then, what do I see here that helps guide us to wind our expectation, winding our expectations down? Well, the first observation that, that I would make is that we need to determine what is the right baseline for our expectations. Here's what I mean, okay? Peter is trying to understand what, what the path ahead is going to look like for him. But he also is concerned about what the pathway is going to look like for others. And he, as he glances around, he sees John, his buddy John. John, one of the closest disciples to Jesus. One of Peter's, certainly his best friend, or closest, one of his closest friends. In this chapter, Jesus repeatedly hammers home three principles of what his expectations of Peter are supposed to be, all right? Um, he asks him, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? So the first one is clearly unconditional love for Jesus. That's just very obvious. All right? But then a second expectation is that Jesus has of Peter is um, that, that Peter would have a selfless servant's heart. Okay? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. And then the third thing that Jesus is expecting of Peter, and this is again, this again is repeated two times, and that is fully obedient following of Jesus. You must follow me, he says, repeating what he had just told Peter five minutes earlier. Peter, follow me. And Jesus has made it clear in verse 18 that a day is coming when Peter won't determine his own destiny, but authorities that he'll have to submit to will determine that destiny for him. And that will lead him to crucifixion. When Peter looks at John and says, Lord, what about him? He's saying, well, I hope you're expecting the same things about John. That's his baseline. All right? Listen, the baseline for what we should expect in life can never be what others experience in life. And we get this wrong so often. Yes, in the Christian church, our baseline is what is God's will for you individually. Full stop. End of sentence. Period. That's what Jesus means when he responds to Peter and he says, Hey, Peter, essentially, if I want to bless John by keeping him alive um, until I return, by keeping him alive for 100 more years or 50 more years, how does that affect your requirement to obey? How does that affect your requirement to serve, your requirement to follow me fully? You must follow me. End of discussion. You see, Peter's baseline of expectations was determined by a sense of fairness, a sense of equality. People often have expectations for life that are tied to that same baseline. 
wait a second, I deserve the same raise, raise that she got. Hold on now. I should get as much playing time as my friend. My child should get as much playing time as the coach's child. Wait, my, my share of the inheritance should have been equal to, to his share. My retirement ought to be comparable to my sister's retirement. Um, so equality and fairness is this notion that we take and we superimpose it over what we should be able to expect in life, what we should be able to expect from God. And when it doesn't meet up, it's like disappointment. It's like we're, we're totally devastated by that. And God is saying, no, Peter. Jesus is saying, no, Peter, there is no way that you can take my plans for John and, and determine that he, those plans have to be the same as my plans for you. For some people, the baseline is, <clears throat> if I work hard, I should be able to always expect good things and that everything should go well with me. I might be able to expect life to go better for me than how it went for my parents. Politicians have used similar logic um, with this invalid expectation is probably the best word I can think of it, um, where they have asked this question. This goes back to uh, um, commercials that I saw, I think, in the 1980s. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? All right. We are so foolish to... <laughs> to listen to politicians as if that's the right expectation to have, all right? When we accept that um, set of expectations, it's like totally removed from a mature understanding of a world that we live in that's so infected by sin that the infection just keeps getting worse and worse, all right? Do we really believe that, that sin, that, 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 that an increased amount of sin in our world is going to lead to a, a much better world for us to exist in? How foolish of us. Well, in Numbers 11, back in the Old Testament, as the Israelites are wandering around in the, in the desert, they, they get disgusted at having to eat manna all the time, and they complain, they grumble at Moses in Numbers chapter 11, <coughs> because it was so hard and they didn't have any meat. And they said, we wish we could go back to to Egypt, we had all the free fish we could we could have back there, and we were able to eat leeks and onions and garlic is what they are longing to have back in their diet again. For some people, their baseline of expectations is tied to some more desirable previous chapter of life, even if they totally forget how that chapter of life really was for them. But a basic understanding, just a a simple rudimentary kindergarten understanding of God's perfect holiness and our abject sinfulness would have us concluding that the baseline could justifiably be set at zero. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. He says this, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Well, how much could a totally unrighteous people deserve from a perfectly holy God? Paul's answer to that would be nothing. Thank God that there is something called grace and mercy. And when we realize that we deserve nothing from him and he offers to us an eternity in paradise with him without any eternal penalty for our sin, for those of us who trust him and ask forgiveness for our sins, well, my expectations <laughs> for the rest of life can be fine at zero. Easy to say, harder to live out, okay? So our expectations should be tied to the baseline of God's will and our unworthiness to receive any inheritance of blessing from that will. All right, so there's another principle I see in these verses, and that is this. Peter's being told to follow, in the verses previously to this, he's being told to follow by serving others that God entrusts to his care. So, in our expectations, it is meeting others' needs that should be our focus not a desire to duplicate their blessings. Listen carefully. 
Following Jesus is never defined by the pursuit of earthly pleasures. Jesus had told Peter three times, take care of my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. You know what farmers call that? They call that doing the chores. I, I know, that doesn't sound like a, a popular author's book title. My best life now, your best life now. No, it, it's not consistent with that, all right? What Jesus is saying to Peter, he's saying, Peter, you should expect to spend your existence serving people in need. That's what I did. That's what I'm calling you to do. And it's very consistent with, with actually a, a quite overlooked chapter uh, of teaching of Jesus, all right? It, it surfaces in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 17. I believe Luke's the only uh, gospel writer that includes this teaching of Jesus. And this is what it says, Luke 17, starting at verse 7. Jesus says this, Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field after a long day of work, Come along now and sit down and eat. No, Jesus says, won't he rather say, Hey, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank, Jesus says, will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? The implication is no. So you also, when you've done everything you were told to do, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Now, there is a whole message, a whole sermon about marriage that's hiding in these verses. Um, what do you expect when you come home from a full, days of work, full day, day of work uh, when your spouse is also coming home after a full day of work and both of you just want to sit down and relax and turn the TV on while you get fed supper? All right, guys, I think the message is probably more common for us than for our spouses, okay? Um, well, if neither partner has a servant mindset, you're headed for marriage problems, okay? Um, Jesus is making it clear that as servants, our expectations are sometimes totally unreasonable. As an unworthy servant, that's what Jesus is referring to us as. As an unworthy servant, my experiences are that I should focus first on my duties, meeting others' needs, and then on my reward, on my recompense, on my compensation, on what I get in return. Listen to me, servants have no business adopting the expectations of kings. Simple as that. Our reward comes much later. Jesus is trying to get Peter to readjust his thinking, okay? You're a servant. You feed sheep. People follow you, but you don't lead with authority. And, and, and overlording it over them, you lead by taking care of them. All right? Now, there's one more insight that um, it took a while before it jumped out at me. And it's from verse 22, all right? Which is the verse where, John, where Jesus says, If I want John, if I want John to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Now, a, a, a quick, just surface looking at this verse would say that Jesus is saying, hey, if I want John to not have to endure any difficulty and stay alive until I return, what is that to you? Okay, um, it, that's how we might interpret that and all. But, but I think there's more here, okay? The, the principle I'm getting at is this. Our expectations have to be grounded in an understanding of the bigger picture. All right? Peter's expectations aren't grounded in that bigger picture. So, to, to help you see this, let's, um, let's construct an imaginary timeline today, okay? So, this story is taking place um, at the end of Jesus' earthly life. I mean, his ascension is just moments away, all right? And uh, most scholars believe that this was happening uh, between 30 and 33 AD, okay? They're, they're not in full agreement on that. It probably really doesn't matter all that much, okay? Um, and after Jesus' ascension, then Peter and John go on. You look in the early chapters of the book of, of Acts, and they do ministry together. They are clearly the main two leaders in the church, all right? Um, and they serve as key ministers, key leaders in the church, um, apparently probably for a few years um, together, all right? And like everyone else, all the other disciples, all the other followers of Jesus, they expected Jesus to be returning fairly soon. Five years, maybe, 10 years, maybe, 20 years, hopefully, 
50 years? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, but Jesus didn't return. And for years, for decades, both Peter and John experienced various levels of opposition and resistance and persecution, physical persecution. Okay. Now, ancient, ancient Christian tradition, which actually is far more reliable than I used to think it was, okay? Ancient Christian tradition is pretty, pretty unanimous that Peter was crucified by the Emperor Nero in Rome around the year AD 65, okay? Now, let's just pick a random day as the day maybe when, when Peter was crucified. You might not know it, but um, some of the, the, the ancient church religions actually have, have um, a... a a saint whose name is attached to many of the days in the calendar, all right? Um, France has done this, and, and it's common in Catholic countries uh, throughout Africa and all. And the day actually that's, um, that's connected with uh, Saint Peter is June 29th, all right? So let's just pull that day out of, the, out of the air, and let's just say that that was the day that Peter was going to ended up being crucified. <clears throat> June 29th, and let's just say that the year that it happened in the year 65 AD. If that were true, and I'm not saying that it is, but as an example, if that were true, that month of June 65, when Peter certainly would have been like, if not arrested, he was already being imprisoned <clears throat> and then condemned to death and then having to be crucified. That month of June, 65 AD, um, who had a better month of June that year, do you think? Peter or John? Well, pretty obviously it'd be John, okay? <coughs> If Peter was crucified on June 29th, whose June 29th was less painful? Peter? Peter's June 29th or John's June 29th? Well, the answer to that is pretty clear as well. June 29th. But now let me ask you this question. Whose June 30th would have been better? <laughs> the tide has changed. Peter's. Peter's been taken to heaven. He is Existing with Jesus once again, the, the Savior that he loved you know, so imperfectly, but he did love him. And Peter, excuse me, so Peter's in paradise with Jesus, and John's still on this earth. The next month was, then was July. Whose July would have been better? Well, that's pretty obvious. Peter's a whole month in paradise. John's a whole month still being persecuted, still being resisted, still being hated by Jewish leaders and Roman leaders alike. Church history tells us that Peter died in AD 65, but that John didn't die until AD 95. 30 more years John had of putting up with persecution here in this earth. And for every day of the remaining 30 years of John's life, it was Peter's existence who was infinitely, whose existence was infinitely better than John's. You know, for years when my dad was older, um, like in his 70s and his 80s, periodically he'd find out about a friend or an acquaintance or a relative or whatever who had passed away. And uh, I don't remember him ever saying this about any women, but he would say this about men from time to time. He'd find out that somebody was 82 and they died. And my dad would sometimes um, be around me and he would say, that lucky dog. <laughs> my dad didn't hate life. He was just one of the most joy-filled people you might ever meet. But he would say, that lucky dog. What was he saying? He wasn't wishing away his life on this earth. He just knew that there was this relishing of what his existence in eternity was going to be. And his older brother, Raul, had already experienced that, that lucky dog, Raul. You know, he's already with Jesus. Um, deep in his heart, John might have thought something similar about Peter. You know, if they both knew that Peter was going to be crucified and John maybe not crucified, and John didn't die from crucifixion, um, Church History tells us that he died from old age, and if they both would have known that, it would have been Peter that would have said, that lucky dog, John, he's not going to have to die by, by uh, crucifixion. But <laughs> after Peter was with Jesus, it was John who maybe every day might have looked at it and said, well, the crucifixion part wasn't very good, but that lucky dog, Peter, he's back with Jesus again. In the grand scheme of things, Peter's kind of communicating that he's hoping for, what, a longer life that would include suffering and being persecuted? Well, that expectation sure looks foolish. Just like 
so many expectations of mine can look when my expectations align not with reality but with illusions, with small picture thinking rather than big picture realities. One miscellaneous observation, and I'll wrap this up, okay? This dialogue between Peter and John, excuse me, between, between Peter and Jesus, it happens when, when Peter turns around to look at his friend. When we turn around and look at others, um, our life is going to be misguided. Life in Peter's life was still so misguided, and it was partly because of this. We don't follow God well when we're looking backwards with envy at other people's lives, rather than looking forward with faith while walking by Jesus' side. So in the short dialogue, these short three verses, it seems that first Peter sees John's destiny as the baseline, not God's perfect individual will for Peter to be the baseline. It seems that Peter sees himself as deserving something better than a servant, and it seems that he acts as though <clears throat> continuation of this earthly life is preferable to heavenly paradise. Well, those three things are a recipe for discontentment, disillusionment, dissatisfaction, and disappointment. So do the wise thing. Wind your expectations down to zero. Let's pray. Make us be people, God, who are realistic, not idealistic, who look at a world infected by sin and look at our salvation and realize that our salvation delivers us from the ramifications, the consequences of sin um, totally after we die, but not totally while we live on this earth. And give us, God, a perspective, um, give us expectations that don't expect more from you than what you have promised to us in your word. That don't expect more for, from you than what we see in the lives of others. May we simply say, your will is what I pursue. I am willing to be a servant no matter what it entails for me. And I will focus all of my life here on this earth to honor you knowing that the day is coming when I get to experience you totally in heaven and the reward there will certainly not disappoint me. May we wind our, our expectations down to zero in a way that honors you well. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful week.